So today we are going to talk about how to interpret cancer nutritional research and learn what to trust. I'm excited that Francesca is here to provide some guidance on what cancer nutritional research we can trust. There's so much information out there and it gets really confusing, especially with the clickbait and the headlines and the things that's out there that's maybe confusing us. Um, and we, we need to know, um, as the title says, what it is that we can trust. What foods are good, what to avoid, what diets work best. Everybody has an opinion. And so we need to learn what it is to look for that's telling us as close to the truth as we have as possible because research is always moving forward. This session will help us find stillness in the noise and help us learn how to best take care of our nutrition as we go along the myeloma journey. It is now my pleasure to introduce Francesca Castro to you. As a level three re clinical research dietitian nutritionist, that's an awesome title, <laughs> she focuses on providing whole food plant-based diet interventions to patients within the myeloma service. She joined the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in December of 2021. Her special interests include the impact of dietary choices on both cancer prevention and progression, gastrointestinal microbiome, and evidence-based clinical care. She earned her master's in nutrition and exercise physiology at Teachers College Columbia University and her bachelor's in biomedical science at the University of Central Florida. She is a registered dietitian nutritionist with the CDR and has applied to be a certified dietitian nutritionist in New York State. So with that being said, um, uh, then with that being said, you can uh, go ahead and present now, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Um, hi, everyone. I am Francesca Castro. Um, let me share my slides quickly. Okay, so as Audrey mentioned, I'm going to be um, speaking about how to interpret nutrition research and learning what to trust. This is a topic that comes up very frequently as a person in the research field, not only by patients, but also just friends, family, and even people I meet when I tell them what I do. Um, hopefully after today, I can alleviate some anxiety you might have when it comes to all the headlines out there when you see on diet, nutrition, um, and cancer. So this is just an overview of what I'm going to go over today. I just want to cover um, all of these topics. Um, and first, I want to just do a quick um, overview of what exactly nutrition research is. Um, nutrition research plays an integral role in health recommendations, um, and they contribute to many different areas, the human metabolism, the microbiome, and then also how different dietary exposures affect our health. And by dietary exposures, I mean either a specific food, um, a specific nutrient, or a dietary pattern. Um, they all kind of fall under the umbrella of nutrition research. And nutrition research um, serves as a foundation um, of evidence-based recommendations by not only dietitians but other healthcare professionals. The types of research studies um, that fall under nutrition research are both observational and experimental. Um, observational research poses a minimal risk to participants. It's usually things like case control studies, um, case reports, um, and they usually involve like some type of survey um, or something like that where they're not asking the patient to change their diet, but they're just trying to gain insight on what their typical habits include. Um, many different areas contribute to nutrition research, um, and I just wanted to make sure I cover that as well. And then experimental research imposes a treatment or an intervention on an individual, and it attempts to cause a change, um, whether that be in disease or health um, outcomes. Um, I'm also just including this nice graphic. It's the, called the hierarchy of evidence and research that shows the quality and strength of various research designs. Um, this is just a nice visual of how to evaluate um, evidence based on rigor. 
and what's necessary to kind of guide um, practice guidelines um, going forward. And then this is another nice graphic I found that helps um, visualize the translation from basic science to human patient um, application. There's many steps involved um, to translate data and to make sure um, that um, there's rigor in testing with that data. And the same thing can be said for nutrition research as can be said for uh, different uh, medications and vaccines and things like that. Um, everything has to go under rigorous um, translation requirements. Um, and then I thought this was a nice graphic to just show where people are getting their information and how they rely on their sources. As you can see, it shows how skeptical people are on a variety of sources. Um, they actually trust their friends and family more than they trust like a scientific study um, or an RD. Um, so I hope today I can kind of bridge that gap of like how to interpret scientific studies so you could learn what to trust. Um, and then interpreting nutrition in the media. Um, I just pulled some of the thousands of headlines out there um, about different diets, foods, supplements um, that you know, are out there in the media that make it sound like it's either making us or breaking us based off of one little habit here or there. Um, I'm here to help form a foundation on how to look at an article and make a critical assessment about it and help you engage in healthy skepticism of modern day media and kind of try to determine what works best for you as an individual. So I thought one of the best ways to do it was to just break down an article. Um, this article was published in the New York Times, uh, which is a reputable publication. And I mean that in the sense that they undergo fact checking um, and their journalists have very specific guidelines to follow. Um, but even though it is a reputable publication, um, I do still wanna break down what to look for when you're interpreting even research headlines in um, any type of publication. So the first thing is looking at the title. Does the, does the title make bold claims? As you can see here, the title is a question. It's posed as a question, which is a good sign. They're not, um, you know, voicing about a miracle or a cure or anything like that. Um, they're just raising a question that can fruits and vegetables boost brain health? Um, and then as you wanna go into the article, you wanna dig deeper. What are the claims that they're trying to make? Do they include any specifics about the population, about the limitations of the study? As you can see here, um, I highlighted some areas um, about how there's growing evidence that what we eat can affect brain health. Um, but it says, because it's an observational study, not an experimental study, you cannot prove cause and effect. Um, and then it goes into specifics about what vegetables and fruits they looked at that had higher um, flavonoid uh, makeup and what association they had with cognitive decline specifically, um, kind of highlighting what type of brain health that they were aiming at. Um, Additionally to that, you want to look at, is there information on the study design? Is there information on the duration of the study, um, which this article does a good job of including? Um, and then is there information about the population? Does this population match you as an individual? Um, it, is there any details about the sample size? Is it a big enough sample size? Did they use gold standard methods? just to get a better sense of how this study was conducted and how to apply it um, to real life scenarios. And then one of the most important things is to see is, are they citing the original study? Are they including any other citations? Maybe take a look at that if you're really interested in the um, study question and the results. And then finally, you wanna look at who wrote the article, what are their credentials, um, and what are the credentials of those of whom they are citing in that article? So as you can see in this article, they are citing various researchers who weren't even involved in the study. So it shows 
um, unbiasedness in the report. Um, and yeah, so I am giving a couple of quick tips on how to evaluate research. I know we'll be sharing these slides. So this is kind of just a nice slide to go back to um, when you're feeling like, what can I look for? One of the biggest things is finding the original source material. So if you see something in the media, I'll go back to one of my slides with all of the different headlines. Um, can exercise cancel out booze, says study. Instead of taking that article and committing it to memory and kind of saying, okay, well, if I exercise and it cancels out everything about alcohol, I would actually dive deeper into that article, find out where they're actually citing it from and read the original source material. I think that is the, one of the most important aspects of evaluating research, not relying solely on the headlines. While the headlines can kind of give you um, an idea of what the trends are leaning towards, always, always, always important to go back to the original source material. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit about resources that can help you in finding the original source material. Um, and then you also want to look at where was the research published? Um, was it published recently? Typically, we like to look at um, research published in the last three to five years. Um, if it's a little bit longer than that, you want to try to find if there is research out there that has backed up the claims if it's a little bit older. Um, what are the credentials again? Are there conflicts of interest? Um, and again, another thing is if you're thinking about implementing anything you see from a research study, it's always helpful to discuss it with your healthcare provider or finding a registered dietitian to help you, um, you know, break through the noise a little bit um, and determine if these um, findings are right for you to incorporate. And then another important point is association versus causation. Um, this is very important when you're looking at research. Um, for example, the, the study that I showed about fruits and vegetables and brain health, they said it might have a relationship with improved brain health. It's only observational, so they're not able to make any causative statements. I like this diagram that kind of shows when it's sunny, um, people tend to eat more ice cream. And then when it's sunny, people also tend to get sunburn, but it does not mean that eating ice cream causes a sunburn and getting a sunburn causes us to eat ice cream. There might be um, a relationship there, but does not mean that they cause one another. And then why is nutrition research so difficult? Um, well, one, science is always evolving. Um, Diet and people are nuanced. Um, people, it's hard to study diet in a sense because people are eating, they have to eat every day and it's hard to isolate um, in the same sense as like a medicinal compound. And then among that is the confusion of headlines out there. There's so many different headlines. Um, going back to my other slide, you saw in the Times article, there was an article from the 90s that said, fat is bad, um, not to have any types of fat. And that's when low fat diets were really popular. And then another Times um, cover from 2014 that was talking about the keto diet and the benefits of butter. So just things like that get very confusing for patients. And that's why I think it's more important to look deeper and look at the original source material and talk with um, healthcare providers to help you um, determine what's best for you. And then I thought to do another one, um, specifically a article about cancer. So I'm going to break this down similarly to how I did with um, the New York Times article and also bring up the original source material. So as you can see, this headline is making a bold claim. It's saying mushroom consumption lowers the risk of cancer by 45%. So if I was to see this, um, I would think, OK, so I just need to start eating mushrooms right away. Um, but it's a bold claim. Those, that's a red flag in terms of um, research. You want to look deeper when you see a bold claim. Um, what's nice about this article, this was the entirety of the article. Um, the study population was noted and the original research was linked, but it was a very short article. 
there was not much on the methods of the study. There was not much about the strengths of the study and the limitations. It kind of really broke it down um, in very concise terms, which is nice as a reader, but it's not so nice in evaluating um, the quality of this research. So looking into the research a little more deeply, I highlighted some things in the abstract, but for sake of time, I'm not gonna go through the full article, but um, in a case like this, I would like to, and I do like to um, dive a little bit deeper, but um, as you could see, they noted it's a potential health benefit. Um, it was a systematic review, um, which is nice. So they looked at all of the research. Um, they looked at risks of cancer at any site, and they said that mushroom consumption, the highest compared to the lowest um, consumption was associated with less cancer. Um, so it's nice, they did note word potential, like I said, systematic meta-analysis. So looking at many different studies, compiling the consensus of data, um, not just looking at one study, it may indicate a protective effect. So may, we don't know for sure. Um, and then there's not much in the abstract about the amount of mushrooms. It just says highest compared to the lowest. I did look a little bit deeper. The highest consumption was 18 grams of mushrooms a day, and that's an average versus zero grams a day of mushrooms. Um, so just based off of conversion, that's about a quarter cup of mushrooms a day. Um, I wouldn't look at this article and say to myself, okay, I need to start consuming a quarter mushrooms a day. I would maybe say adding mushrooms into my regular diet might be overall beneficial for my health. Of course, one, if I could tolerate mushrooms, um, if I don't have an allergy to mushrooms, but overall adding mushrooms as one of my veggie choices might be overall helpful. Um, so looking back, looking at a broader sense of things, um, one of the broad, themes I like to apply when looking at research and trying to understand how to use it in real life. Um, what are the common themes in research? So a really good example is many headlines and many research highlight the benefit of various fruits and vegetables. In the previous article we looked at, they looked at mushrooms. There's many other out there. The brain health article said fruits and vegetables as a whole. They broke down um, higher consumption of higher flavonoid intake like strawberries and Brussels sprouts, um, crucifer cruciferous veggies and berries. So as you can see, all of those items are fruit and vegetables. So you can make um, a pretty good assumption that including more fruits and vegetables in your diet may be beneficial for overall health in many different senses. Um, another important question to ask yourself is, does the study population reflect you? If you are, um, I'm using myself as an example just because it's the easiest, but I am a 20 something year old female. Um, and if I'm looking at a study who their study population is in 50 year old males, um, maybe those results might not apply to me. So you have to take that into account. Um, and then another question to ask is, is there any conflicting research out there? Um, I know there's so much, so it's always good to know both sides of the story and compare their study methods. Um, and importantly is, have you spoken to your healthcare provider? I know I keep saying that, but it is important to know, especially when changing your diet rapidly um, in you know, uh, making any dietary pattern changes. And then trying to avoid anecdotal claims as much as possible. Um, always try to find the original source um, instead of somebody just saying, I ate oatmeal for breakfast for 25 years and I'm the picture of perfect health. We want to dive deeper and just understand the entire um, encompassing health of that individual instead of just one area. Um, and then these are some really good resources. Um, where to find good um, nutrition breakdowns. We have the American Institute of Cancer Research, the World Cancer Fund, American Cancer Society. And then for finding primary sources, oftentimes if you see um, a research study written about in the media, they will link to the primary source, but it's oftentimes hard to get that primary source for free because sometimes there's paywalls. So there is um, an unpaywall.org that allows 
you to get free access. Um, there's also PubMed and Google Scholar that oftentimes have free PDFs of the studies. And then one of my favorite ways is just emailing the corresponding author. If you can't find the full PDF of that um, article, email that corresponding author. And most of the time they are more than happy um, to give you that article to review. Um, and again, being in research, um, there's a lot of information out there, even as a practitioner, but these are some nice places um, to um, look for different recommendations and look what the research are saying. The World Cancer Research Fund actually does um, a yearly breakdown of everything and they have a nice cancer food matrix of how much research has been done on a specific food or specific dietary pattern and where the research is leaning. Um, and again, I think um, it could be, it's important to speak with a clinician because they can kind of put it into context to yourself because just because one study is saying something, it doesn't necessarily mean it is true for you as an individual. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to um, note, I do work on the nutrivention studies with Dr. Shaw. I know she has spoken um, to the nutrition and wellness chapter in the past. Um, she is a myeloma physician at MSK, leading nutrition research in the myeloma space. I'm trying to highlight um, three of our trials that are currently ongoing. Um, if you're interested in learning more um, about these trials, you could definitely visit this link. It's a little form um, to sign up and I'll um, provide you with more information. Um, Nutrivention 2 um, is a study that's going to be completely telehealth that we're partnering with HealthTree on. Um, enrollment is due to begin soon in about April. We'll have more details coming soon. Nutrivention 3 um, has just opened uh, at MSK and then we're pending enrollment at Emory. Excuse me, sorry, I'm getting over a cold. And the Nutrivention 4 is for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma and there's a sub-study component to it, which is the whole food plant-based diet. All of these studies have a whole food plant-based diet component as well as a supplement arm um, and there's more details in that link and I'm happy to go over more details if anyone has any questions. And then we are also, um, in addition to doing the clinical trials, working on patient surveys um, to just bring it all back. The trials here are experimental trials and the surveys here are observational. So this is just um, for us to get some more information about differences in dietary patterns between racial groups, and then also to get um, some information about supplement use. And I don't think I made this point, but although observational trials are not, you can't make positive statements for them, they are extremely important because they inform research down the line. That's where that translational um, diagram that I shared kind of comes into play. There's multiple steps. You can't just start a trial um, without having some background information beforehand. Um, and that's all from me. I think this is, uh, this is just uh, more information about the trials. I know Dr. Shaw talks about them in these two videos that are on the YouTube channel. Um, and then this is my contact information if anyone wants to reach out. Um, and thank you all. Thank you, Francesca. That was awesome. You did that so clearly and in a friendly way that was easy to understand, and I really do appreciate it. Um, just so our audience uh, knows or is reminded, those slides will be sent out to you so you can review them. Um, it's important to us that you not only learn today, but then you're able to keep using these practices in the future, because there is so much that we need to navigate through and learn how to trust. <laughs> I feel like maybe, you know, nutrition might be the most, well, that's a bold claim, that's a bold claim, but it's one of the most uh, controversial topics out there. Everybody has an opinion. <laughs> um, so Sandy has a great question. If anybody else has further questions, we would love to hear them. Feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, and if you just have a question about something that you've heard, for example, a headline, is this true? What are your thoughts on this? Feel free to put that in the questions because it's good to 
uh, get things out in the open, I think. So Sandy says, awesome overview of research skills to vet sources. What are your thoughts on foodfacts.org? Good question, Sandy. I'm actually not so familiar with foodfacts.org. Um, sometimes you have to be a little bit wary of certain um, you know, websites, but I'm not so familiar with it, so I can't speak. But if it they do break down research, again, I would always go back to the original sources because any good website that is overviewing um, research will always cite their sources. Um, so you'll see places like WebMD, um, Healthline, those type of places will always have a citation list either linked or at the end of the article. So that's what you wanna look for and always kind of go back to um, the original source. Yeah, and I think it might be foodfacts.com because I looked uh, and foodfacts.org is not a website. So just so our audience knows. Um, okay, Mo, Luz is saying most trials take years before results are shown. Is the trials, is it for the same with trials based on nutrition or supplements? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. It actually differs a little bit just because everyone's eating, right? And everyone's dietary pattern is different. So through observational studies, you're actually able to gain a lot of insight about different dietary behaviors and potential relationships with disease outcomes and health. Um, so it kind of gives you a head start in that regard, where, for example, there is some studies in myeloma that show vegans and vegetarians have maybe a reduced risk, a potentially reduced risk of developing myeloma um, compared to those who are not vegan and vegetarian. So that's just one example. And using that um, information, it kind of um, helps inform bigger trials like the Nutrivention trial to see if that's a case in a more controlled setting. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, we're getting lots of great questions, so I'm excited to ask them. <laughs> uh, Ton is saying, I've seen a few interviews of people who say that they were healed from cancer by nutrition and exercise. Is that possible? Yeah, that, that's also a very good question. I would become wary about big statements of like healing and curing. Um, I definitely think they play a very important role in not only cancer treatment, but cancer progression, survivorship, and prevention. Um, I won't say it's not possible, but I don't know the specific circumstances in which you're talking about. So I don't wanna um, talk about something that I don't know the full details um, associated. Yeah, and I'll just add to that and say, you know, if, if cancer was curable by nutrition and exercise, I'm pretty sure there wouldn't be cancer anymore. Um, if it was that simple, I wish it was. And as Francesca said, I, there's definite benefits in overall wellness to exercise and nutrition in accompaniment with medications. But I don't think we're at the point right now to say that of that blanket statement. First of all, which cancer are you talking about? Second of all, what kind of exercise? Third of all, what kind of nutrition? You know, and so, yeah, hopefully um, we yeah, can- Yeah, that's take a great a, point. And we can take a step back when we hear the those kind of things and say, okay, what, what, do I, what are they really saying when they say this? Francine is wondering if there's certain vitamins helpful to patients that had a stem cell transplant for multiple myeloma. Yeah, that's a good question. Also, um, there is a lot of research right now, actually, at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, there's another um, set of colleagues who are looking at the microbiome specifically in determining um, what foods and supplements might help with stem cell transplant, um, post stem cell transplant. So I think it's hard to say what, you know, might help. It's very individualized. Um, but I definitely think overall diet, um, I always um, try to use a food first approach of where we can alter maybe our habits a little bit um, to be more healthier, whether it be adding in more fiber through whole grains and fruits and veggies or having, um, 
you know, a source of protein with every meal or snack. Um, little things like that will help. Um, for sure over vitamins, but there's definitely a space for vitamins, but I would have to know what um, medications you're on. And it's, it's so individualized. So I can't just make a blanketed statement, say everyone should take um, curcumin or something like that. But I will say <laughs> curcumin is part of our trials. So that's something we are interested in and trying to understand um, more deeply because some of the curcumin data out there does say that it helps with inflammation specifically related um, to myeloma. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's important to note that the research on supplements is so new. That question earlier where, you know, it takes years really to get definitive answers and we're just not there yet, but it's because of patients like you asking these questions that we're even able to do these studies to find those answers. So keep asking the questions, keep being curious. And my suggestion is to work with a dietitian that's at your local center where you're getting the stem cell transplant or where you got the stem cell transplant, ask them the questions because they're going to know what medications you got, how you're recovering. And then as Francesca said, I'll just echo again, Dr. Irvi Shaw, who's basically dedicated her life to figuring out this uh, connection between nutrition and myeloma. Um, she's very food first as well. So as Francesca said, while supplements do play a role, we should not depend on them for our health. We should make sure that what we're putting into our body is healthy. That is wide variety of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and proteins and things like that so that we can remain healthy rather than depending on a, um, you know, mushroom extract, for example, not saying you should do that, but for example, to, to improve your health. Joanne's wondering, I've read an article that Sloan uses a mushroom, ex speaking of mushroom extracts, that uses a mushroom extract as an integrative component of cancer treatment. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's a, another great question. Um, there's a whole integrative medicine service at Sloan, which is really awesome that we're able to utilize um, for our patients. Um, I wish, you know, that was the standard um, of care everywhere of having that integrative medicine component. I don't know specifically the mushroom extract that you're looking at. There's so much different research at Sloan. Um, it's hard to keep updated with everything happening. Um, but I definitely think, you know, even the study that I had mentioned with the mushrooms, there's very strong compounds of mushrooms that are associated with either reduced inflammation or increased um, brain activity and things like that. And there is promising data out there. Um, but again, um, to say that everyone should be taking it, um, we can't make those um, statements yet. Awesome. Thank you. Um, have well, you there's, Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, there's also one thing I wanted to know in regards to things like supplements. Um, they aren't regulated. So when you see supplements in a study, um, those are a specific dosage. They're made for the specific study. They're, you know, tested and, you know, approved to be given to patients, especially patients in cancer settings who might have, you know, immune compromisation or something like that. Um, so when you're buying supplements from, you know, online or in the drugstore or something, there might not always be the same, same thing. Um, and then they can put other compounds in there to kind of fluff them up a little bit. So that's also something to be very aware of if you are going to implement supplements to always speak with your healthcare provider to make sure there's no medicine interactions with them and to also make sure that you're getting a good supplement that has been either third party tested, um, you know, or approved. Um, in that sense. Definitely. I was actually disappointed. Costco, you know, I love Costco. I'm obsessed with Costco, but their supplements usually have things like sugar and unneeded additives in them that make it, you know, would you rather just to eat healthy food instead of taking this thing that's supposed to be healthy for you, but has some things in it that I'd prefer not to put into my body, you know? Definitely. Okay, so let's head back to stem cell transplant. I know there's lots of studies still being done on this, but we know about the restrictive stem cell transplant diet for those who are neutropenic after their stem cell transplants. 
Um, a question here about eating raw honey. Is that just post stem cell transplant that they shouldn't, or is it forever after their after somebody receives an autologous stem cell transplant? Good question. Yeah, I believe it's um, just the post recovery period. Um, I'm not so familiar on those specific guidelines, but it does come from the fact that raw honey specifically um, doesn't undergo pasteurization um, to kill any bacteria that might be. And because those who have undergone um, this you know, very serious transplant where their immune systems are compromised, they're at even higher risk of um, you know, coming up with an infection or something, a bacteria that you're a typical healthy person before a transplant might be able to nip um, through their immune system, you might not be able to post transplant. So things like, you know, raw sushi, raw honey, unpasteurized milk, all of that type of stuff um, can pose a risk. Thank you. Um, a couple questions here about alkaline water, the alkaline diet. Is this diet recommended? There's a lot of buzz around it in multiple myeloma, a couple people saying they've been cured. Yes. Um, alkaline diet is one of those other, you know, hot topics similar to like determinate fasting or, um, like keto or something like that. Um, alkaline water, um, actually, um, neutralizes when it enters your stomach due to like the stomach acid. Um, so some people say that it helps them with GERD and things. Personally, I haven't seen a lot of research out there that has proven those claims. Uh, a lot of the time with alkaline water, um, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, they're drinking more water outside of the norm. So just that intake, increase of water intake is helping their GERD and helping their health overall. So that might be helping. Um, as far as an alkaline diet outside of just alkaline water, similar things. An alkaline diet involves a lot of fruits and veggies and whole foods. Um, so it's hard to say if the specific alkalinity of the diet is helping them or just the overall better healthful dietary patterns. Um, yeah, great point. Again, yes. I would I would always dive into the original sources about alkaline diet. I know there isn't too much research out there, and that's why you also um, have to be wary sometimes about you know very um, uh, highly uh, <laughs> highly um, media diets that are out there um, to be wary if there's, it's out there a lot, but then you look and there's not many sources um, in the research that are, you know, talking about these diets or doing research on these diets. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, couple participants saying, thank you uh, for taking the time to educate us when you're not hundred percent well. So we hope that you get better after this. <laughs> thank I you. am really grateful. <laughs> So Steve shares an awesome experience, was diagnosed with IgG myeloma in 2020, and four months ago found that they had a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that was treated successfully with diet and exercise and a much heavier plant-based diet. Within a few months, all of his labs were looking incredible. Um, oh, no, his, his lab, his red counts were looking low, but an iron gummy resolved this. So, okay. So basically I think what he's saying, and thank you so much, Steve, for, for this experience and, and hopefully I'm, uh, you continue to do better and better. Um, when we switch, for example, from a heavy meat, especially red meat diet, which is a typical kind of American diet to a whole food plant-based diet, iron is one of the things that I think people need to be aware of. What else or what other things do they need to be aware of if they're kind of switching from the meat and potatoes diet to a whole food plant-based sort of diet? Definitely. Yeah, that's very important um, to kind of just take a look at yourself and your labs um, and your overall energy levels as well, um, especially when you're tr transitioning to a plant-based diet, which is very different. Um, the iron in meats are more bioavailable 
um, to your body to you utilize. So the iron in veggies and beans and things, they're there, but um, they're not as bioavailable. So things like um, just even looking up um, how to make things a little bit more bioavailable. Um, a good one for iron is pairing it um, with vitamin C. It helps with the absorption. Um, so when you're having beans, pairing it with um, like salsa or um, having a side orange after lunch or with your lunch or something like that are all helpful, um, but also working closely with your healthcare professional to keep an eye on your labs. Um, especially um, when you're making a transition. If you're also going under treatment at the same time, it's especially important to do that. Um, the things like iron, things like B12, I saw a couple of questions, um, just making sure that you are um, not deficient in those before you even start the diet, because you don't know, it can even make a deficiency a little bit worse if you're borderline. So just keeping aware of those. Um, for B12 and iron, taking a supplement if necessary, and then kind of just figuring out in your diet where you could add um, a little bit here and there. There's also these like iron fishes that you could use to boil your beans in, and it kind of brings more iron into them. Um, for B12, there's things like nutritional yeast that you can add if you're plant-based, um, but B12 does um, have a role in energy metabolism. So if you are deficient, um, you can experience things like fatigue or chemo brain, um, where it can kind of make those things a little bit worse down the line. So just keeping an eye on your numbers um, and you know, discussing with your healthcare provider and a dietitian where you could kind of tweak things and add things into your diet to, to kind of bridge the gap. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we had a couple of questions uh, regarding B12 and if it really does help with chemo brain staying on top of that B12. So I think that's super important, um, keeping track of iron B12 and just having monitored labs and, and having that open discussion with your healthcare team. Hey, I'm making this significant transition in my life and I want you to help me stay healthy. <laughs> exactly. Um, Marietta asks a really good question. Many food manufacturers of less healthy foods seem to be the ones sponsoring studies. How can I be less discouraged over the claims? This is a patient and not a research scientist. Yes, yeah, that is such a great point. And that specifically is why I highlighted earlier in my slides of who is funding research. It's always important when you're looking at the research to see who is funding it. Um, not to say that some of that research isn't rigorous and isn't good, but you do want to just be aware of who is funding the research and um, specifically about like the claims that they are claiming. You have to look into the methods, look at the study population. So for example, if um, a soda company is sponsoring some type of study where they're saying soda isn't bad, um, look at what methods they're using. How are they measuring bad? Um, are they looking at health outcomes? Are they looking at, um, you know, weight, obesity factors, all of that things, blood sugar, diabetes, or, or are they just looking at, um, you know, the amount they exercise in the day that it's not slowing down or just quality of life assessments where they're just reporting it subjectively saying they feel good. So just looking at what they're using to measure and then also comparing it to the bulk of the research out there. So soda is just one example. Um, a lot of research shows that sugar sweetened beverage, those who consume, it's associated with a lot of different, um, maybe more negative health outcomes. So if that is an outlier among the pack, that's also a red flag. Um, but there's also food companies that might be contributing to research in a more helpful sense, just to um, understand the food system and people's food choices a little bit better as well. So you just have to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I was just thinking as you were talking, you know, these not healthy food scientists get incredible researchers on their team to create like the perfect tip or the most addicting whatever, you know, you think about- exactly. 
you think about, you know, sour cream and cheddar ruffles, you think about, you know, Pepsi, like that literally went through years of research to find out what's the best taste that we can get the most people to buy. So it's not <laughs> that they're unfamiliar with research. It's that they're very, yeah, <laughs> very they're, specific they're about what they do. Coming up with the exact combination to entice somebody to make them keep buying their products, not only from a nutrition nutrient standpoint, but also from like an advertising standpoint, just to keep you um, sold and continually buying their product. Um, it, it which works. I know is I mean, they're difficult. good at what they do. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to navigate at times. Um, and yeah. we're all human. So I totally understand. Um, so Peggy, along with that, um, we, you know, we're talking about sugar. Peggy has a great question about sugar fueling cancer. Um, we've had a talk in the past, you know, about inflammation and cancer and um, sugar has a relationship with inflammation. So what is your suggestions? I mean, do you suggest to, I mean, I know you're a researched dietitian, but <laughs> does the clinic suggest a complete sugar-free diet, a sugar limitation? I mean, what's, what, what's the connection there and, and what are your suggestions? Yeah. Yeah, that is um, an awesome question. Um, as far as from a clinical standpoint, um, specifically, I'm just talking from my experience at um, MSK. No one is um, no one is counseling a sugar-free diet unless completely necessary. Um, sugar has been shown to have a relationship with inflammation, cancer, diabetes, all of these other comorbidities. Um, that also have a relationship with cancer. So it's like a cycle. Um, but with that said, it's more about your overall dietary pattern, um, I think is the most important. Just looking at the research of, they're always observationally asking about dietary pattern as a whole. Usually these surveys are asking in the last week, in the last month, in the last year. Um, so that is showing over time what a dietary pattern looks like. And then they you know, break it down that way and use like a database to figure out nutrients. Even in our study, we're looking at over time of three months, um, somebody's compliance to whole food plant-based. Um, I always tell my patients it's about progress, not perfection. So if you have a celebration, um, you have a social event where you're having a piece of cake, you don't want to you know, you want the full sugar cake. You don't want to use an alternative sugar or do a no sugar added. That's fine. Let's look at your diet as a whole. Is the cake one piece of cake? And then you had, you know, fruitful, nice meal of pr lean protein with fruits and veggies and whole grains for the rest of your meals. That I think is the most important, just really zoning out to the bigger picture instead of trying to isolate every single um, item that you're putting into your body. Um, I think yeah, it's I important that. overall. Yeah. And helps you want to continue to eat healthier as you go forward because it's a mental game too. You don't want to get too hard on yourself or you're not going to be able to progress or progress. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You can definitely experience burnout when you're making these big changes. Um, so even like, I know there was some plant-based questions and things like that. When you're transitioning to plant-based, um, even small changes can be helpful over time. Um, just imagine if you switched, um, you know, from having just a piece of steak for dinner um, and you had cheesy potatoes or something, this is just completely, <laughs> I'm pulling out of my head. You, you know, you transition to having maybe half of the portion of steak, you did half of the portion of potatoes and you added a cup of broccoli and a side salad. Over time, that addition will really give you benefits. Um, not only are you increasing fiber, you're increasing all of these other nutrients and compounds that the studies are talking about, the flavonoids, the, the vitamins, the minerals, all of those things, they're increasing over time as you add little tweaks to your diet every day, um, I think is one of the biggest takeaways. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Christina asks a great question here on the topic of sugar. If we're eating more fruit, should we be concerned about the amount of sugar in them? Yeah, good, very good question. Um, a lot of the research is specifically on refined and added sugar. Um, so things that are added to processed foods or added to baked goods or something like that. Um, fruit, 
um, we all know is naturally occurring, obviously. Um, so what I like to tell patients is having the whole fruit over, you know, a fruit juice, because the fruit juice is kind of just isolating the sugar in the fruit, whereas the whole fruit has the fiber and different minerals um, to kind of help round out the fruit. Um, and then having fruit, if you're worried about a blood sugar spike, uh, pairing it with a fat or a protein, whether it be a piece of uh, some nuts or peanut butter or um, a piece of toast or something like that, that'll help balance it out. Um, I'm all about balance of the plate when it comes to both snacks and meals, having a little bit of fat, a little bit of protein and a little bit of carbohydrates um, whenever you're kind of thinking about eating. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, my garbage truck was going by, so I <laughs> wanted to mute myself. Um, uh, the beginning question that Sandy asked about new, um, food facts is actually nutritionfacts.org. Oh, yes. So Yeah, I am familiar with that. Um, Michael Greger, I believe, mm -hmm. is yes. nutritionfacts.org. Yeah, he has a lot of good information, um, and he actually cites all of his um, information, like in all of his blog posts and articles, um, you can always find the citations there. Um, Great. Okay. There's a There's about eight questions left and I want to try to hit them all before we finish today. Um, so Glenn's question um, is a general one. Is there a best type of diet overall? Is there a diet that's like, this is the one to follow? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, it's very highly individualized, right? Um, I will say, um, I, I'm not biased, but I am biased right? because our trials are on plant-based diets. Um, and a lot of the evidence shows that fruits and the more fruits and vegetables you add to the, your diet, the more helpful it might be in their outcome. So I think it's not about a specific diet, whether it be keto, intermittent fasting, um, vegan, I think just looking at your plate and determining what makes up that plate um, is most important because you could do keto and have fully processed everything, um, or you could do keto and have whole foods. So I think those are more important, um, identifying whole food components, um, no matter what you identify as, <laughs> as your diet pattern. Yeah, yeah, perfectly said. Thank you. Do you have any um, insight about chlorine dioxide? No, I don't actually. I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, is it possible to take too many supplements that um, might exasperate the progression from smoldering myeloma to active myeloma? I'm not so much sure if it will exasperate the progression, but I do think there is such a thing as taking too much supplements. Um, especially because you're eating, um, you know, we all have to eat. And then the addition of the supplements, you sometimes can hit that upper limit of the micronutrient, whether it be the vitamin or the mineral. Um, and then in addition, other um, medications you might be having, you don't know the um, medication interaction among the supplements. And then since there's such new research in supplements in general, we don't know the combination effects a lot of the time of different supplements. So you might have two supplements that both have anti-inflammatory um, claims, but together, we don't know. There's still research out there depending on what supplement it might be. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Luce is wondering, what should we look for when researching supplements or websites that sell supplements? Great question. I think one of the most important things is of course, speaking to your healthcare provider, uh, maybe gaining some insight about potential medication interactions, and then always looking for a third party certification, um, making sure that one, um, they are claim what they're claiming is inside the supplement matches what is actually inside the supplement. And then two, doing your research a little bit further, either going through PubMed or Google Scholar of that particular supplement and all of the research on it will come up. Um, working with a registered dietitian or a healthcare provider can help you kind of do that and take the guesswork out, but you are you can definitely do it yourself. Places like consumerlab.com, there's a paid version and a free version to that, they actually do a lot of um, research breakdown for supplements. Mm -hmm. um, and there's 
different third party um, testing like NSF um, who do these 30 party testing to, to make sure that the supplement claims back what is actually occurring in the science. Yeah, consumer labs, right? It costs money, but it's really, a really I've heard from a lot of patients that it's a great one. It, it, yeah, it's a very awesome research. I know a bunch of colleagues that even use it themselves. Um, and oftentimes you might even be able to ask somebody you know, maybe um, who, <laughs> not to, if you know somebody in college, sometimes they have free access to it. Sometimes you can gain free access through a library system or something like that. So just, you know, figuring out what your best um, in is through there is often yeah. that's helpful. Don't tell Netflix, they'll start making you pay for everything. Um, Meg had a great question about turmeric and or curcumin that are often discussed in the context of benefit of neuropathy and or myeloma. Have these products been studied or assessed regarding their beneficial effects? I'll answer first if you don't mind and then turn the question to you. Um, we had Dr. Terry Golombek. She is from Australia, and this is kind of her passion is figuring out the connection. And so I will send that recording um, out to the group about the role of supplements, what we know and what we don't know. And she specifically studies, you know, an MGUS and smoldering myeloma. Um, there's little data about active myeloma, but um, it's it's being studied, right? Francesca, is that like a yeah. good summarize? Yeah, it? definitely. I you said it perfectly, Audrey. It's being studied currently. We don't know much. Um, there was some, you know, basic science research in mice models um, that were promising. So um, we're still out there, and people um, out there, scientists are looking into the effects of it. So I think it's looking promising, but we can't say for sure. Um, you know, a causal statement that yes, curcumin reduces inflammation for these patients. Yeah. And hopefully we have results soon, especially with these health tree partnered studies. Yes. Um, yeah. Very can. exciting. Me too. Okay. Three more questions. One is about COVID-19. Is there any kind of diet that can help uh, the recovery from COVID? Yeah. Very good question. Um, there was some papers um, earlier on in the pandemic, kind of observational papers um, showing that those, it goes back to once again, um, not to keep reiterating to fruits and vegetables, but those who had a higher intake of fruits and vegetables were covered from COVID faster or had less incidence of COVID. So I think just maintaining an overall healthy dietary pattern um, is helpful um, in recovering from COVID and, um, you know, shortening the extent of it. Yeah. And I think too, not that this will help you recover faster, but I am one of those who gets like kind of fatigued from eating the same kind of foods. So I grew up with my mom telling me, you know, oranges are the best source of vitamin C. Well, do some, I did some research now as a 20 something year old and realized, wow, there's a lot of other foods that contain vitamin Z. You know, it's just <laughs> what your mom tells you. So you yeah. grew up thinking that. And so having variety in your fruits and your vegetables might also help you not get fatigued of eating the same thing and um, help you feel a little bit better. And we wish you a speedy recovery um, to the patient who asked that question. Suzanne is wondering how much animal-based protein is recommended for a mostly plant-based diet? Good question. I think that is a highly individualized, um, you know, answer. Um, I would say typically overall protein intake is um, the recommendation is usually um, 0.8 grams per kilogram. It kind of changes depending if you're undergoing treatment currently, um, depending on your weight and height, that sort of thing. But I wouldn't say there's a perfect ratio of animal-based versus plant-based. Um, just making substitutions when you can to plant-based um, and incorporating plant-based throughout the week, I think is just the most important thing. Um, unfortunately, there's no golden ratio of, you know, I know a lot of people say 80-20 rule, um, but maintaining that exact ratio is often hard. And it, it, it puts a burden on the patient trying to figure out exact ratios. And I think just trying to do your best is um, most important and will make a difference in the long haul. 
Yeah. And I love, you know, what you say to your patients, you know, progress over per- perfection is, is a really great approach to creating a more whole food plant-based diet. And Steve's question, we'll finish with that. Is it okay to replace fresh fruit with Costco frozen organic strawberries and blueberries? I think this is, you know, could be even if you don't have a Costco near you, and this is not a sponsor of Costco. I love Costco. <laughs> but, um, that that equivalent of, you know, I mean, you don't get, I guess, canned peaches or, you know, what about fresh canned and frozen? What is the order there of your preference? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, fresh fruit versus frozen. Um, oftentimes the, fr- uh, the frozen fruits and vegetables are, um, you know, frozen at their peak ripeness. So their peak nutrient um, availability. Um, so oftentimes with a lot of um, fruits and vegetables, the frozen actually has slightly more nutrients um, than the fresh component, but it all comes down to your taste preferences, your um, affordability of them. I know berries are becoming just insanely priced nowadays. So, um, you know, frozen berries are a perfect substitution to fresh. Um, And I don't think in terms of nutrient availability, um, there's not so much difference where I would say, you know, fresh versus frozen versus can. The only thing with can is I would look for things that don't have added um, sugar or fat into it and just look for a pure canned green bean um, or a canned fruit um, in water over like the cocktail sauce, uh, the cocktail juice, um, I think is the most important thing, but they all have a place in your diet. Um, and it all comes down to convenience. What's the most convenient to you? Um, and what is going to actually make you eat more of it? Yeah. Um, do you let fresh fruits go bad in your fridge? I know that sometimes happens to me <laughs> where you have all the intention and then they kind of get a little soft. Then you pop them in the freezer and you're more likely to pull it out of the freezer and you're not so worried about, oh, I forgot about that. So the freezer kind of can make things last longer. Same things with cans. I always have canned things um, on my shelves just for the convenience factor. Um, Sometimes it's a lot easier to grab a can of beans um, and open them and heat them up than, you know, getting dried beans, soaking them overnight and making them. Sometimes it really just comes down to convenience and what's going to get you over that hurdle of a more healthful plate. Yeah, very well said. Thank you. Well, it's time to finish. Do you have any other closing statements that you'd like to give to the group? Thank you so much for being here. No, thank you for having me. Um, I think this topic is very important for patients. And I think the biggest takeaway is not to be intimidated. Um, I know a lot of the time it seems like these type of research studies and articles are trying to be intimidating, trying to prevent um, patients from actually knowing what's happening, yeah. but empowering yourself and engaging in discussion with others is also important. Um, and then, you know, always finding the original source, finding the intention, and most importantly, talking with your healthcare provider. Um, thank you again for having me. This was a great um, discussion. Yeah, thank you. As I said in the beginning, you know, it's about finding the stillness and all of the noise and trying to just figure out what's best for us. So thank you again, Francesca. We really appreciate you. For the group, we're going to finish with just a couple of outro slides. Um, uh, Please join us again on April 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be discussing Organic versus non-organic. This is a big question. And especially as prices rise, it's important to consider what's worth my dollar. What foods should I concentrate on and which foods don't matter or do any of them matter? And what does organic versus non-organic really mean? I mean, this is such an important thing for us to know. So I'm really looking forward to having that presentation with you on April 12th. I also want to let you know about a connect group. So if you haven't heard, Health Tree has launched the Connect platform, which is a way of connecting with other people who are in the same situation as you with myeloma or have the same interests as you, such as this chapter, which is nutrition and wellness. So as you have questions about supplements, as you have great resources that you want to share, even fun recipes that you've learned and want to share with others, I would love for you to post that on Connect. Now, the Connect 
link will come in these slides. It will also come separately in our follow-up email. If you want to join, post an introduction of yourself or maybe some questions that you have about nutrition. This is going to be a great group where we can stay connected outside of our bi-monthly meetings. Other events that you might be interested in. Tonight, we have a Spanish event for those who speak Spanish. It's going to be about stem cell transplant. So for you, if you or your loved ones speak Spanish and want to hear from a Spanish speaking stem cell transplant expert, please join us tonight at 6.30 p.m. Um, mountain. And that's regional because um, Mexico City is in the mountain um, time zone. And then 20, February 22nd at 7 p.m., is our relapsed refractory chapter. We're going to be discussing how does one become refractory to a jug and how to find the next best treatment. And then the 23rd at 2 p.m. is our Black Myeloma Health chapter. This is a really exciting event with three Black Myeloma specialists who are coming to talk about the hope um, of Black Myeloma Health and to celebrate Black History Month. The link to sign up for any of those events and many more events that I haven't mentioned is found at the bottom of the slide and will be included in our follow-up email. Another thank you to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, GSK Genentech, Abby and Amgen. And thank you to each of you for joining today. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day and hope you feel a little bit better after that excellent session. Take care, everyone. Thank you.